Well, good morning. morning. Good to see so many people out this morning. We, if you're visiting with us, we want you to know you are honored guests. We're happy that you chose to be with us. And if you are tuning in to our live stream, it means you found our YouTube channel, Courthouse Church of Christ, and we are honored that you have chosen to tune in with us this morning. This morning's lesson is entitled, Can We Be Saved Like the Thief on the Cross? And we're going to be looking in Luke 23, 39 to 43, but also our scripture reading that Josiah just read for us in Mark 16. So maybe you want to place a marker in both passages, but we're going to be looking in the Luke 23 passage first. The scriptures make clear the conditions for salvation, belief and baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Faith and baptism go hand in hand. There are some that try to excuse or, or exception baptism away, calling it a work. It is an act of faith. It is what God has called us to do. And there's so many passages on this. We're going to look in Mark 16, 16. We'll reference these other passages as we get going. But I know we have many note takers. And so these passages are on there for your reference, as well as the outline and PowerPoint are already on the website for you to download and look at later. So the question is this morning, is there an exception to this rule? And one of the reasons I ask this is because there are those who say the thief on the cross is the exception. They say, but what about the thief on the cross? And in fact, many people attempt to dismiss all these passages by just asking this one question. And they think it's their smoking gun question. What about the thief on the cross? Have you ever studied or talked with someone and tried to get to that position of where they want that forgiveness, they want that pardon and the grace of God, and you tell them what the Bible says they need to do, what Jesus' own words says they need to do, and they say, but what about the thief on the cross? There is a post making the rounds on social media right now in another attempt to show that faith alone saves, and I've seen it on posted by family and friends on my own Uh, personal social media account. And the version that I have seen looks like this. And so I'm going to read it. I know it might be difficult to read for those in the back, but this is the post making the rounds on social media. It says, how does the thief on the cross fit into your theology? No baptism, no communion, no confirmation, no speaking in tongues, no mission trip, no volunteerism, no financial gifts, and no church clothes. He couldn't even bend his knees to pray. He didn't say the sinner's prayer, and among other things, he was a thief. Jesus didn't take away his pain, heal his body, or smite his scoffers. Yet it was a thief who walked into paradise the same hour as Jesus, simply by believing. He had nothing more to offer than his belief that Jesus was who he said he was. No spin from brilliant theologians, no ego or arrogance, no shiny lights, skinny jeans, or crafty words. No fog machines, donuts, or coffee in the lobby. Just a naked, dying man on a cross, unable to even fold his hands to pray. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Quoting John 3.16. That is the good news of the gospel. And while we can say, yes, John 3.16 is the news of the gospel, what we want to ask is, can this conversion of the thief be duplicated today? That's the question before us this morning. The thief on the cross is thought by some to be the exception that would justify salvation at the point of confession that Jesus is Lord or that Jesus is King and that that's all that's needed. And I would point to Romans chapter 3 verse 28 and point out that it was Martin Luther who when he was translating the, this scripture from the Latin into German, he added the word alone. The word alone in Romans 3.28 that says we're saved by faith alone, he added that word alone. It's not found in Latin and it's not found in the Greek. But he added it because it fit his theology. And false teachings surrounding that have spurred ever since. But you look in your modern English versions even today and they have corrected that mistake. You won't find that word there. But I'll tell you what my commentary says. When I look in Romans 3.28, my commentary is very quick to point that out. Yeah, Martin Luther added the word alone. He added to the word of God. And while he added it and we have corrected that, we feel it still fits. That's what my commentary says in my study Bible. No, it doesn't fit or God would have said it. It's not part of God's word. And so we recognize that there are those in the world today who want to tell people who are looking for salvation, who are looking for forgiveness and pardon and grace 
And they want to rob them of that by pointing to the thief on the cross as their example. What's happened is the religious world has elevated the thief to a position to steal the truth of the gospel from the hearts of men still today. There is no doubt, and there is no doubt, that this remorseful thief on the cross was saved. But the question before us this morning is, can people today be saved in the same manner as this thief? Is this conversion duplicated today? And as the gospel went out into all the world through the book of Acts, did they point back to the thief and say, you only need the faith that the thief had? Or was something completely different taught when the disciples went out into the world? So let's go back, cast our minds at Calvary. All four Gospels record that Jesus Christ was crucified with two thieves on either side of him. We see it in all four of the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I want to point something out about the picture that you're looking at in this background picture. When it's appropriate, it has been flipped. And I want you to pay attention to the position of the cross. Like a timeline, this is on the other side of the cross. Do you see that? This is on, we're looking at the, the if, you're facing the, if you're facing the cross, it's on the left side of the cross, right? We're looking at a timeline. This is all the events that happened up to the cross. And then we're going to look when the cross flips and is on the left side of the screen. We're going to look at everything to its right and look at this side of the cross. So I want you to pay attention to the position of the cross. It is intentionally done here. As Jesus was hanging on that cross, paying the ultimate sacrifice for our sins, both of these thieves on either side of him were told in Matthew 27, 44, that both of these thieves at one point in time were insulting Jesus. Here they are, they're, they're sentenced to die the same as he is. But they're caught up with the crowd. The crowd down below at their feet are all mocking and insulting Jesus, Matthew 27, 39 through 43. And then we're told that the thieves on either side, they join in the mockery. They're going to die the same as he is. They're crucified to their cross. They're all going to die by asphyxiation. There's going to come a point where they will no longer be able to lift themselves up to breathe, and they're going to choke to death. Their organs will fail. That's how Jesus died. They're dying the same manner, but they took time to lift themselves up to insult another fellow dying man. But one of them, we find in Luke 23, 39, uh, is specifically singled out. He is hurling insults just like the people we see in Luke 23, 39. And we want to begin our reading in verses 39 through 43, because we're going to see the other guy. He then uses all his strength to lift himself up so that he can rebuke the other guy, admit his own guilt, admit the innocence of Jesus. Other than Pilate, he's the first one to admit the innocence of Jesus in the record and then asked to be remembered when he comes in his kingdom. So let's read this in Luke 23, 39 through 43. One of the thieves who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. So he's trying to tempt him. We're dying here. We're suffering. We've already got nails in our hands and our feet. I have to lift myself up just to talk. Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? So this man lifts himself up, and he says, We're dying the same as this man. We're under the same condemnation. He says, verse 41, And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, calling him by name, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he, speaking of Jesus, he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. We can be overwhelmed with joy as we read this account at the thought of the grace and forgiveness bestowed upon that thief. As he's taking his last breaths, lifting himself up just to be able to speak, and he condemns the other man, pronounces Jesus as innocent, and then declares him as a king because he says, when you come in your kingdom, remember me. We can be overwhelmed with absolute joy that God's grace and forgiveness was bestowed on this man. It's a testament to God's goodness and mercy. 
It's a great reminder that his love knows no bounds, and he wants us to be with him. And for those who turn to him, there is grace, there is forgiveness, and there is pardon. Even as Jesus was suffering on the cross, paying the ultimate penalty and price for our sins, Jesus found time to lift himself up on that cross to speak these words, Today you will be with me in paradise. It is within his divine right to forgive and to set the terms of that forgiveness. The thief was saved because only Jesus has the power to save and to forgive. And he promised the thief would be with him in paradise. What he's promising is you will be with me. The question is, can we be saved like the thief on the cross? Because this social media post is certainly making the rounds And it's sad to look in the comments. I hit the comments on my friends and my family's posts. Becky's always telling me, don't look at the comments. But I couldn't help it. I want to see just someone, some voice of reason saying, that's awesome. That's wonderful. But that's not how we're saved today. And that's not what people were saying. They were saying, I need this. I want this forgiveness. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. Thinking that's going to do it. Because the post said you don't need those things. But that's not right. How is our salvation similar? Because in a sense, our salvation between the thief on the cross and the way we're saved today, there are some similarities. He was saved by grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9 tells us it's not by some mighty work or anything that we're going to do to earn it. It is by the grace of God. And here that grace through faith, we can see is evident in the thief's words. He rebuked the other criminal for mocking Jesus saying, do you not fear God? implying that this thief, in some way, despite his actions that put him on the cross, he's saying, I fear God. He says he acknowledged Jesus' innocence. You and I are here because of what we have done. But this man, the man in the middle, that middle, that sinner cross, he's done nothing to deserve the condemnation that he's suffering with us. He acknowledged his own guilt, Luke 23, 41. We're here because of our deeds Luke 23, 42, he acknowledged his kingship. He called him what Jesus had, a kingdom. You don't have a kingdom if you are not a king. But he recognized his kingdom. And he had faith in Jesus' resurrection as well as his own because he asked Jesus to remember him when he came into his kingdom. He recognized there's something beyond the death and the suffering that they were experiencing. There in Luke 23, verse 42. And so we just like the thief, must put our faith in Jesus. We must acknowledge our own guilt. We must confess our sins and trust in his power to save. Like the thief, if we are forgiven, if we come to Jesus expressing our trust in him, it's not because we've earned forgiveness by doing any great deeds. We recognize Ephesians 2, 8 to 9 says, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. The gospel of Jesus Christ commands believers to be baptized into the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. So then we ask this question. Why do we have to be baptized and he didn't? That's really what people are saying when they say, but what about the thief on the cross? When you are teaching salvation to your friends, your family and neighbors, and you tell them Jesus' simple command is to believe and be baptized in order to be saved, and they say, but what about the thief on the cross? They're really saying, but why do I have to be baptized when he didn't? That's, that's really what it comes down to when you ask this question. The quick answer is it was under the old law, and so it doesn't apply. The thief lived under the law of Moses. Jesus lived under the law of Moses. You know what this is like? This is like us as Americans saying, well, look at Thomas Jefferson. He didn't pay federal income tax. That wasn't passed till 1913. He didn't pay house and car insurance. Why should I? Really, that's what that social media post was saying. The thief didn't do all these things. Why should I? Right? Well, Thomas Jefferson didn't do these things. And I, as an American, why should I then do it? Because the law has changed. He lived before that law. So we look at timelines. We look at context. It'd be like the Jews in Jesus' day saying to Jesus, well, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob didn't keep the old law. What was the old law called? 
law of Moses. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, where did they live before? Before Moses. But it'd be like the Jews saying, well, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they didn't keep the old law. They didn't have these dietary restrictions. They didn't have to keep the Sabbath. They didn't have all these other things. Why should we keep it? Because there was a time where the law changed, right? The law changed. There was a patriarch period where God spoke directly to the patriarchs. Then through Moses, the great lawgiver, God gave his law. And then later the prophets came. But what were the prophets saying? Go back and keep the covenant. Keep the old law. Keep the covenant that you made with God and with Moses. So it's ridiculous to say, well, he didn't do this, so we don't have to, when there's obviously a change in law. It's ridiculous for us to point to any American in our history before 1913 and say, well, they didn't pay federal income tax. Why should I? Because 1913 happened, and that is now the law. It's ridiculous for a Jew to any time period after Moses to then point back to any Jew or any forefather that lived before that and say, well, they didn't keep the old law. Why should I? Because there, there was a change in law. And a change in law was a change in expectation of what God required. And so first, Jesus forgave the sins of this man before the new covenant had been established. The law of Moses was still in effect. I want you to read with me. That we're going to turn over to Hebrews chapter 9. Look at with me in Hebrews chapter 9. There's quite a few passages we're going to reference. But this is an important one, and I feel we ought to read it together while we're here. Read Hebrews 9, 15 to 17 with me. It says, For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, Those who've been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it's never enforced while the one who made it lives. Then he talks about even that first covenant was inaugurated with blood, but he's talking about the blood of bulls and goats, which he says in chapter 10, verse 4, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So, What the Hebrew writer is saying is there was a testament or a will, this first covenant. It was made while one is alive. Jesus died to fulfill that old covenant. The Hebrew writer says in verse 17, for a will takes effect only at death. A new covenant was not in effect yet. The people were at that moment still under the law of Moses. The thief on the cross was forgiven in exactly the same way that the paralytic was forgiven in Matthew 9 his faith in Jesus. When we go back to any of the heroes of faith, we turn to Hebrews 11 and look at all, starting all the way back with Abel. From from Abel on on down to David, and then he mentioned Samson, and he mentioned several others. They were all saved because of their faith in God. And depending on the time period, they met the requirements for that faith in God. Faith is not just a feeling. Faith is action. And that Facebook post that we read together earlier makes it seem as if we just have this warm, fuzzy feeling that comes over us and we say, I believe in Jesus and I want that forgiveness, I want the pardon, I want the grace, but I don't want to have to do anything for it. And while we recognize nothing that we do, no work is going to do it, God's grace tells us through that new covenant how to be in that right relationship with him. But at this point in time, they're under the Old Testament. Jesus, after his resurrection, said he came to fulfill the law, the Psalms, and the prophets in Luke 24, 44 through 47. This is very specific. Jesus says he came to fulfill what was said about him in the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. The way the Hebrew Bible was put together, this was its entirety. This would, what he's saying is, I came to fulfill the old covenant. All of it, the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. In Hebrews 7, 22, Hebrews 8, 6, and verse 13, Jesus rose from the dead and he became the mediator of a new covenant, making the old one obsolete, or, if you don't like the word obsolete, the Hebrew writer uses that word, Jesus uses the word fulfilled. So the old covenant became obsolete, it became fulfilled. 
That means the new covenant began after his death and after his resurrection. So when we read Mark 16, 16, where he says, believe and be baptized to be saved, and all it takes to be condemned is to not believe at all, these words in Mark 16, 16 were after his resurrection, and they're fully carried out on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 under the new covenant. Now, I want to talk about that more in just a second. But secondly, when someone says, what about the thief on the cross? Second, the Christian gospel had not yet been preached. After his resurrection, I want you to read this with me. Look in Luke chapter 24, verse 47. This is very important. Go back to Luke 24, and really starting in verse 44, is where he says, Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all the things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. And, notice verse 47, And that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. Had that happened yet? No. No. It had not happened yet. So Jesus is still talking about something that's going to happen in the future. For repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You know what he's referencing is a prophecy made by the prophet Isaiah. God foretold it all the way back in Isaiah chapter 2 and verses 1 to 2. That all the nations would come to Zion and from Zion the word of God would be sounded forth. Jesus is saying this is going to happen and it's going to be proclaimed from Jerusalem. Forgiveness of sins had not yet begun to be preached. But it was on the day of Pentecost when Peter said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This was an answer to Acts 2.37 to the Jews saying, Brethren, what do we do? Peter had just convicted them of the murder of the Son of God. Jesus hanging on that cross was just put on their shoulders. Ten days after Jesus rose to be with God forever, sitting at his right hand, the day of Pentecost happens. Peter says, you murdered the Christ. You put him to death at the hands of godless men. They said, what do we do about it? And his answer was, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. He didn't say, let me remind you about the thief on the cross. Let me lead you in a prayer that you can read, that you can just quote from Rose. That's not what he said. He said, you want forgiveness? You want absolution? You want grace? You want pardon? You need to repent and then be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This gift is not the supernatural spiritual gifts, but the gift of salvation to them and their children, those who would obey. So third, on this side of the cross, here's why it's absurd. People say, well, the thief on the cross wasn't baptized, so why do I need to be? What does baptism symbolize? And we're going to look at a picture a little later on, but none of those things, none of these things mattered at this time. When the thief was dying on the cross next to Jesus, I want you to think about what baptism means and why the thief didn't have to do those things. One, baptism is about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus was still alive. He had not yet died. The thief was talking with him, side by side. Romans 6, 3 through 7. I want you to try to understand why it would be absurd to think that the thief on the cross would be under the same command to be baptized as people are today. Read with me Romans 6, 3 through 7. Romans 6, 3 through 7. <clears throat> Or do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. So what does the word of God teach about salvation, this side of the cross? Baptism is a symbol 
of Jesus' death, his burial, and resurrection. And in our baptism, we demonstrate all three of these things. These three things had not yet happened on the other side of the cross. Forgiveness of sins was proclaimed to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem, just as Jesus said it would be in Luke 24, 46 through 47. The thief on the cross never heard Jesus say, one must believe and be baptized to be saved, because Jesus had not yet commanded it. In Mark 16, in Mark 15, 16, I want you to see how strong this command is. I want to thank Josiah for the scripture reading this morning. Look back in Mark 16 with me, in verse 15. And I want you to notice how strong this command is. And this was not spoken to the thief on the cross. This was not spoken to any Jew before Jesus died, buried, and rose again. But after his resurrection, as Jesus is preparing them for what was going to take place in Jerusalem, he says in verse 15, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who is believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who is disbelieved shall be condemned. Jesus commanded baptism to be saved of all disciples of all nations. Jesus said similar words in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. He says, all authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. Go into all the world and teach and baptize them, making disciples, teaching them all that I told you to do or teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. All creation, all mankind of every nation are to be told to believe and be baptized. The apostles taught that very thing first on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2.38 to the Jews. Ananias came to Saul of Tarsus, another Jew, in Acts 22.16 and told him how to call on the name of the Lord was through baptism. And, and then later in Romans 6, 3 through 7 that we read, and we're going to reference 1 Peter 3, 21, where it says, baptism now saves you. Baptism wouldn't save the thief on the cross because it didn't symbolize anything at that point. And some people get in a, a, an argument of, was the thief baptized in John's baptism? We do read that John baptized many people at the Jordan. We don't know. The text doesn't tell us because it's not important. What is important is Jesus' commands for us today to receive that salvation. We cannot duplicate the events at the cross on Calvary. In Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, Ananias told Saul of Tarsus, those who believe in Jesus as the Son of God are to confess him as Lord and be baptized into his name. Acts twenty two sixteen says that is how the prophecy from Joel chapter 2, 28 to 30, is in full effect. Just as Peter explained it to the Jews on the day of Pentecost, Ananias says it to Saul of Tarsus. He says, Why do you delay? Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. We live under a different covenant. And on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, the Jews who were the first converts under that new covenant were convicted of Jesus' murder. They asked what they needed to do about it. And Peter and the other 11 apostles' answer was, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins into the name of Jesus. We live under a different covenant. The Hebrew writer puts it this way in Hebrews 8, 6, a better covenant with better promises. We live under a better covenant with better promises than those who lived during Jesus' life on earth. In Hebrews 9, 15 to 17 that we read earlier, a new covenant that became effective at the death of Jesus after his resurrection because he is the will and testator of this new covenant. It was also prophesied. What Hebrews 8, 9 all the way through 10 do is they quote from Jeremiah 34, 34 where Jeremiah prophesied from God that there was coming a day that a new covenant would be made. Jesus is the fulfillment of that. Again, he is the fulfillment of the prophets, just as he said in Luke 24, verse 44 through 47. Jesus and the apostles teach one must believe and be baptized to be saved. And while we can rejoice and not take anything away from the joy that must have filled that thief's dying heart, to hear Jesus, the King, say, today you will be with me in paradise. Our salvation today is even more gloriously different than it was for that thief on the cross. Because salvation today is a more complete picture of what God has done for mankind. And it's part of a new and better covenant 
with God. Hebrews 7.22 says he's the mediator of a better covenant. So this morning, if you want to enter into this new and better covenant, you must be baptized. And there's one last final point that I want to make that is a similarity that we share with the thief on the cross, and that is we must be crucified with Jesus. The thief was physically crucified with Jesus, an event that cannot be repeated. This is something that will never be duplicated. That's why we don't point to the thief as the example of conversion today. It was a one-time and unique scenario. But, but a similarity we do share is saints are to be spiritually crucified with Jesus. The thief was crucified with Jesus. And brother, brothers and sisters, we are to be crucified with Jesus. So then the question becomes, how can we be crucified with Jesus? How can we be crucified with him? The neat thing about baptism is in a way we are saved exactly like the thief on the cross. Not that he was baptized, but we must, like the thief, be crucified. Paul says in Galatians 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This wasn't just something for Paul. We must all do the same. He says in Galatians 5.24, writing, still writing that letter to the saints at Galatia, he says, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So we ask the question, how can we be crucified with Jesus? And we again turn to, Gal to Romans 6, 3-7. Romans 6, 3-7. Saints are baptized into his death, and in so doing, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Notice the cycle here. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? How do we share in his death? Through baptism. We've been buried with him through baptism into death. When you, when you repent of your sins, you are putting that old self to death then you are put into the waters of baptism, a full immersion. You are buried with him through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead, you are raised up from the waters of baptism through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. An important question to ask when people say, what about the thief on the cross, is how do you want to be freed from your sin? Do you want to be freed from your sin? The answer to do that is through baptism, because it is only through that that God has prescribed that we put to death that old self, we bury him, and we rise up walking in newness of life. There is an awesome illustration that speaks to Romans 6, 3-7. The gospel reenacted in baptism. And in each step demonstrates Jesus' role and ours. One, as Jesus died on the cross, we repent of our sins. We confess him just as the thief did as king and lord of our lives. Then we are buried under the waters of baptism just as Jesus was put in the tomb. And we rise to walk in newness of life just as Jesus rose to new life. Romans 6, 3-7 through seven is a beautiful picture of what happens when one is baptized. When we decide to follow Jesus, we crucify our old self. When we are crucified with him, then we're crucified with him just like the thief on the cross was, but in a spiritual sense. We put that old self to death, we bury it in baptism, and we raise to walk in new life. Baptism is now required as an act of obedient faith for salvation. Peter simply says in 1 Peter 3.21, baptism now saves you. When we look at the thief on the cross from Luke 23, the thief on the cross is a great example of God's forgiveness and grace. It shows us it's never too late to come to the Lord in this life. That's what it shows us. With his dying breaths, he lifted himself up with the last remaining strength he had to say, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It's a beautiful picture. But the thief on the cross is not our example of how to be saved today. 
His salvation was based upon a different covenant with different circumstances and a different relationship to Jesus. Instead of the question, what about the thief on the cross? What I want people to get to ask is, what, how am I saved today? What do I need to do today to receive forgiveness? To hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. If you trust Jesus as the thief did, you'll do what Jesus said to do. After Jesus died on that cross, right next to the thief, he was buried in a tomb, and he rose from the dead. He told his apostles to go out and spread the word of the good news about what he had done. He told them in Mark 16, 16, He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Faith is all about trusting in God. The thief on the cross trusted Jesus. Do you? Jesus said, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. The thief was not told that, but you are. You are. Do you trust Jesus? Will your trust be evidenced through your actions? James 2 tells us faith without works is dead. We have to demonstrate to God our belief, our faith. Baptism is us saying to Jesus, I believe you, I trust you, please save me. That's why when you're baptized, Acts twenty two sixteen 16 says you're calling on his name. So what I try to say when we get into discussions with our friends, family, and neighbors, and they say, what about the thief on the cross? And we come to this point in the, in the discussion. Let's stop making excuses. Let's stop arguing. Let's just trust Jesus enough to do what Jesus said to do on this side of the cross, because baptism now saves you. Those who attempt to find an exception to baptism in the experience of the thief on the cross, they do so to try to justify that baptism is not required of men today. And, it, and to them, it's just an exception. Those who teach such doctrines ignore the scriptures and allow the thief on the cross to remain a thief. He was remorseful. He repented. But they allow him to continue to be a thief and to rob the truth from their hearts of those who might be seeking salvation. And I do want to recognize this. When you see posts like this on your own social media accounts, and this is making its rounds, and I imagine it's going to keep going for a while, when you see posts like this making the rounds on social media by your friends and family, maybe they're seeking forgiveness of sins. Maybe they're seeking the grace of God because they recognize a need for it. Show them how to obey the gospel in the way Jesus taught, that they might receive that grace and forgiveness. It's what I did on my family's post. Those with a heart for truth, who live on this side of the cross, Seeking forgiveness means embracing the teachings begun at Pentecost where a new covenant was forged for us to embrace and the kingdom established where we can still say to the king, remember us. There's an old preacher, I can't remember his name, it just escaped me. But he used to end every lesson by saying, if you miss heaven, you've missed everything. Heaven is too wonderful and hell is too terrible for us to risk being misled by the false beliefs concerning the thief on the cross. Obey the gospel today the way Jesus taught his apostles to teach it. Mark 16, 15 to 16, it is commanded of all men of all nations, believe and be baptized in order to be saved. Perhaps you're with us this morning. Maybe you're visiting us this morning and you're here because you recognize you want forgiveness for your sins. You want the grace and pardon that can only be found in Jesus. If you trust in him the way the thief trusted in him, then do as Jesus has said to do. Hear the gospel. Believe in Jesus. Repent of your sins. Confess him as Lord and as King. Be baptized into his name for the forgiveness of your sins and then remain faithful. And this morning, if you are a Christian and you haven't been living the way that you should, don't let sin be a barrier between you and your God. Don't let sin be the barrier that when you face Jesus, you say, but I just couldn't give this one thing up. Give it up. Surrender it. He is our rock. He is our shield. He is our Savior. And whatever your request might be this morning, the waters of baptism, to have the grace and the pardon and the mercy and forgiveness of Jesus, or the prayers of the congregation on your behalf for things that you might be struggling with. No, you don't have to struggle with it alone. But you have brothers and sisters ready to pray with you and for you. You have but to come forward and let your request be known while we stand and sing.